This is Connor Lennon from UN News. The climate emergency is causing untold damage to the environment, the economy and society in general. But there is some good news. We are actually transitioning away from a fossil fuel energy system to one that's more reliant on renewable energies such as wind and solar. But there is a catch. In order to make this transition, we're going to have to mine a lot more minerals. Things like copper, aluminium, nickel, cobalt. And the fact is, mining is a pretty dirty process. So what can we do to make it more sustainable, to make sure that we're respecting the human rights of the people that are mining these minerals? Yeah. To find out more, I had a chat earlier with Ligia Narodna. She's the head of the New York office of the UN Environment Programme. There's a big jump in demand for minerals. Do you see this as a good thing or a bad thing? Look, there's a jump in demand for minerals because the energy transition is underway. And there is a lot of uh, focus on it at the moment. Uh, a number of countries are focusing on this. And with the energy transition underway, the minerals to support the energy transition are also increasing in demand. Now, how much of this demand actually happens or not, and what is going to be the demand depends really on climate ambition and depends on how this plays out. So projections are very high about this. Whether it's good or bad really depends on how these minerals are actually extracted. So what are the right conditions for that? And what we see at the moment is a bit of a conundrum because on the one hand, you have the climate goals, which have to be uh, arrived at. You have the sustainable development goals but you also have the biodiversity and all of the environmental issues, right? So, what, so they can be in conflict at exactly, times. Exactly, exactly. So you can have global goals, environmental, local environmental goals, which can be in some conflict. So you need to get it right. Uh, yeah, very complicated because there are, as you say, all these different aspects. Human rights is another one that, uh, that we touch on. Well, let's talk a bit more about these minerals. I know that you're from a, yeah. a mineral background uh, as an economist. You've worked in energy for a long time. So where are most of these minerals found? Are they all over the world or in just a few countries? They're actually all over the world, but some of them are concentrated. So there's copper, lithium. Lithium is concentrated in a few countries. You have the cobalt, mostly in DRC, 70% of it in DRC. You have nickel in Indonesia and uh, in some other countries. So you have pockets of concentration. The rare earths are in China. So the production is in some countries. The processing is mostly in China. And so there is a certain amount of concentration at the moment in these minerals. Which, which sometimes causes a certain amount of concern because will they come out in time? Will there be supply chain disruptions? And so sometimes you hear this word critical uh, minerals and the critical is actually connected with the fact that they are critical for the transition, but they are also critical because they may be subject to, to supply chain disruptions. And so how do you address this and how do you want to focus on these issues really becomes of importance. Now, there's also the question of, uh, it's been called for years, the resource curse. Mm. The countries that are richest in the most important, say fossil fuels, for example, minerals, they should be very rich, but often that doesn't happen. Do you think in this case, in the, the case of the energy transition, that it's likely that people in those countries will benefit? Yeah. So, so this is the whole thing. Because the, um, this is a great opportunity for many of the developing countries, because most of these minerals are in the less developed countries and some in the landlocked least developed countries. And because they exist there and because there's this huge demand and there's an urgency and there is a scale, okay, both of these provide an opportunity for these countries to actually benefit from this in terms of revenues, development opportunities, etc. The issue is, will the speed and the scale also create human rights problems, create environmental problems? Will they create more pollution? How can one do that in a more sustainable way? Uh, because there are so many initiatives around the world. There's the Extractive uh, Transparency Initiative. There is the Mining Policy Framework of the Intergovernmental Government Framework. There's a lot of these initiatives around, but they're very fragmented. They don't come together. What we really in the UN are now looking at is ways in which you can have some kind of global um, collective action, bringing the UN bodies together to see what is it that we can do to take forward some kind of support to both um, 
building trust across the mineral supply chain, but also um, enhancing capacities in the countries that have these so that you avoid the resource curse. The resource curse happens because the, you know, the prices of the commodities sometimes create dysfunctionalities between different other resources and other economic activities that exist there. And so those activities that existed decline and the commodities go up. And then you have a situation where the commodity prices change and the volatility hits the countries. And then, of course, sometimes there are, there's corruption, there is you know, a whole bunch of other issues which come up, which prevent the people from benefiting from this. So they very often are subject to all kinds of um, environmental and social uh, pains without getting the gain from this industry. And so the idea is how can we reduce the pain and enhance the gain? And to summarize again, the UN's role in all this, it's to yeah. bring together all these fragmented initiatives yeah. into, into international regulations, mechanisms, whatever you want to call them, yeah. to, to really formalize everything that's happening and yeah. improve the situation. Yeah. It's not so much about regulation, but it's more about um, some kind of coming together to see how you can harmonize, how you can bring together these various things to so talk to each other. Um, because what happens typically, and why the UN is involved, is really to move forward this agenda to make this into something that benefits the developing world, but benefits the, the larger community, because climate change is affecting us all. We need energy transitions for everybody. But how do you enable this to go together? So, you know, what is the kind of policy coordination that we can think about to move this agenda forward in a very um, systematic way? And that's what the UN is doing. Well, we're talking just before you uh, head off to the airport pretty soon, I guess, to catch a flight to yeah. Nairobi because you're going to be going over there for UNEA. That's the UN Environmental Assembly. It's the 10th year of the UN. You know, well, let's explain what it is, first of all. So I've heard it described as the world's environmental parliament. Is that, <laughs> is that an interesting way of describing yeah, it? Yeah, it's, you know, it's the largest environmental um, decision-making body. It, brings together not only the member states, 193 member states, but also brings together a number of multi-stakeholder groups. You have the business, you have um, you know, civil society, you have the academia, you have everybody there. And this year you will have um, even the multilateral environmental agreements, the UN agencies, all of them will be there. So, so what it does is it enables you to have to set the global environmental agenda. It enables the decisions and actions and conversations around many of the very important environmental topics. Right now we're focusing on the triple planetary crisis, which is climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. So this UNEA, which is the sixth session of the United Nations Environmental Assembly, is really focusing on what could be these actions to address this. Because very often we say, okay, here's the science, here's the early warning, here's the problem. But we don't sufficiently focus on what the solutions are. So the idea is, can we come up with some solutions? Can we think of ways in which we can focus on how we resolve the problems of, of the environment? And I know that this issue of minerals is going to be brought up in discussions, of course, one of the, the key environmental topics. Uh, talk me through a couple of the other big ones. I know finance, of course, is going to be yeah. a big topic, not just at UNEA, but at the big climate conference at the end of the year. Yeah. So just to back up a bit on minerals, why minerals is so interesting uh, as an environmental agenda is because it speaks to climate change, it speaks to biodiversity loss, and it speaks to pollution. And so it cuts across all of these, and it's very important in the context of sustainable development and development, right? So the, the uh, idea is that you cannot discuss environment without discussing development. You cannot discuss environment without looking at peace and conflict. You cannot discuss environment without looking at health issues. So these are interconnected. And so most of the work at UNEA is really looking at environment in a much bigger connected way. So to your question, what else are we discussing? There's discussions around chemicals and waste. There's discussion around biodiversity. There's discussion around circularity and sustainable consumption and production. And then there is a whole lot of discussion on environmental multilateralism. So when I say discussion around, means there are a number of resolutions that are being, that have been put forward by member states. And these resolutions are being negotiated as we speak in what's called the Open-Ended uh, Committee of, Public, of Permanent Representatives. Or, uh, and that 
will then come into Monday where it starts getting more formalized and then decisions are taken when the high level segment happens on the 29th. So not just a talking shop? Absolutely not. At the end of it, we have resolutions with very clear asks of UNEP saying, UNEP executive director, you need to do this, 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 and report back at the next UNEA. So just to give you an example, at the last UNEA, a resolution was on the plastics agreement to arrive at a plastics, you know, plastic pollution agreement. How do we uh, look at this whole problem? Right now, for the last year and a half, we are discussing, negotiating the plastics agreement. So member states come together and they discuss it. The fourth uh, INC, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, is in April in Canada. And then the last one will be next year. So at the end of it, you may have an agreement. That's the idea, to have an international agreement on how to deal with plastic pollution. So every UNEA comes up with resolutions, some of which could lead to larger things like an agreement, or it could be also um, tasks to give UNEP mandates to work on. Well, lovely to talk to you and explaining all about UNEA, and yes. we look forward to talking to you soon. Have, have a great flight. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. The UN Environment Assembly takes place at the UN headquarters in Nairobi from the 26th of February until the 1st of March. You can find out a lot more about the big environmental topics and the UN's role in tackling them at news.un.org.